Before starting with the webinar, I will introduce uh, ISGAN. ISGAN is the short name for International Smart Grid Action Network, a technology collaboration program of the International Energy Agency. ISGAN is also an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial, formally established in 2011. ISGAN creates a strategy platform to support high-level government attention and action for the accelerated development and deployment of smarter and cleaner electricity grids around the world. ISGAN consists of 27 contracted parties. They nominate a representative from the executive committee headed by the presidium, assisted by two co-secretariats and, and the ISGAN operating agents. The ISGAN's vision is to accelerate progress on key aspects of, of smart grid policy, technology and investment through voluntary participation by government in projects and programs. ISGAN activities focus on five principal areas, policy standards and regulation, finance and business models, technology system development, workforce skills and knowledge, user and consumer engagement. ISGAN facilitates dynamic knowledge sharing technical assistance, peer review, and project coordination among its contracted parties. The ISGAN value proposition relies on conferences and workshops, policy and technology briefs, discussion and technical papers, case books, and webinars. Within ISGAN, ISGAN Virtual Learning offers the ISGAN community means of rational and continuous technical skill complement and update in the field of smart grids. The Academy is proposed as a set of e-learning and reading core modules dealing with the entire value chain of smart grids. The webinar today concerns the smart management of the grid, exploring the line temperature and low forecast. This webinar presents the findings of the Italian demo of the Osmose project, which tested different kinds of flexibility solutions in a nine month long experimentation on a real HV grid portion. One of these is the flexibility from the green itself. By exploiting accurate load and generation forecasts and cost-effective dynamic thermal rating solutions, a new energy management system was developed in order to detect and solve efficiently congestion in a three hours higher the horizon. The speakers of today are Leonardo Petrocchi from Terna, Giuseppe Lisciandrello from Terna, Davide Ronzio from RSC, da sorry, Dario Ronzio from RSC, Davide Poli from Enciel, and Alfredo Vaccaro from Enciel. Please pose questions using the question and answer tool. The speakers will answer at the end of the presentation. The recording of this webinar will be available through the Hisgan YouTube channel. Now I leave the, the floor to the speakers. To Leonardo, please take the floor. Enjoy the webinar. Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. Just one moment to share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see it well. Okay, now I should be fine. So welcome everybody. I'm Leonardo Petrocchi from the R&D department of Terna, the, the Italian transmission system operator for electricity. And uh, I was the um, work package leader for uh, the Italian demo that uh, Matteo introduced. And uh, this is the agenda for today. So I will give a brief introduction to what is the project and what was the demonstrator, the Italian demonstrator. And then I will leave the floor to my colleagues to explain uh, in detail the energy management system algorithm that was developed. The, um, the forecast system that um, allowed us to, to make uh, congestion detection on uh, uh, three hours ahead horizon. And uh, finally, the, the innovative techniques that were developed for dynamic thermal rating of the power lines. And uh, then I will take the, the floor uh, at the end to, to draw the conclusion of the project. So uh, just some... Uh, brief information about the, the project. Uh, first of all, it was a, a European pro funded project by the uh, Horizon 2020, now Horizon Europe program under the call LCE uh, of uh, April 2017. And uh, the, the project started in 2018. So we are finally at the end of the project. It, it uh, will finish this month formally. 
and um, the, the key aspect of this project was to investigate and develop a, a solution for uh, uh, integrating smart grid and storage techniques uh, technology sorry for uh, uh, managing uh, IRS penetration and this was done by a consortium of uh, TSO led uh, members as you can see in the slide there were four demonstrators uh, one in France and Switzerland uh, led by RT one in uh, the border between Slovenia and Italy by Alesh one in Spain by Red Electrica de España and finally the one we're presenting today which is the Italian demo from uh, led by Terna uh, the the Italian demo uh, was of course involved uh, of course uh, uh, many uh, many partners from all the value chain of the energy sector so we involve uh, balancing services providers and power producer from rest power plants uh, r d centers and academy we have here uh, members from ncl and rsc speaking and of course the industry um, such as itachi abb ibm and engineering to make all the possible hardware and software upgrades uh, so, uh, before leaving the floor to my colleagues, I will just explain what was the project, uh, the Italian demo at least. The Italian demo had the, the goal of uh, identifying um, uh, the technical, uh, the technical economic feasibility of uh, service provision, so flexibility service provision from uh, three mainstream, which are grid assets, uh, the industrial demand side response, and from wind power plants. And as you can see, it was uh, a real life demo in operational condition you can see here a portion of the italian grid this is in the south between the region of uh, apulia and basilicata it was a sub transmission portion of seven lines uh, characterized by a lot of uh, renewable energy source power plants uh, mostly wind and but also solar and um, we uh, we decided to to test uh, uh, congestion management and voltage regulation service provision from industrial demand response. We involve seven industrial loads. We will not talk about this today, and as well as uh, uh, stability services from uh, wind power plants. So synthetic inertia with and without coupled storage and uh, voltage regulation with uh, from uh, wind power plants. Again, we will not talk about this. We will focus on the last stream on these slides, which is the flexibility from the grid by exploiting uh, load forecasts and uh, innovative dynamic thermal rating techniques with respect to the uh, commercial available ones. Uh, all managed by this uh, energy management system we developed uh, in order to 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 perform advanced dispatching so without further ado i leave the floor to my colleague giuseppe we will first explain what was uh, the development of the zone energy management system thank you yeah thank you leonardo uh i'm sharing my screen i hope you can see now so um, I will talk to you about the general energy management system that, as, uh, as uh, Leonardo uh, said, it's like the brain of the uh, demonstrator, since its main goal is to manage congestions in the demo area. So it is basically, basically uh, an optimal power flow, so a uh, power flow calculation uh, in order to uh, detect and manage congestions with three hours ahead, uh, with a three hours ahead optimization. So basically this software um, has got two innovative aspects. The first one is that it is focused not only in the actual quarter hour, but it, it is a forecast algorithm. So it see, it forecasts three hours ahead um, congestions. Indeed, uh, it uses not only standard methods to solve congestions, uh, standard methods like the redispatching of the production units, like Terna already uh, do, does. But uh, it uses also innovative uh, uh, tools like the dynamic thermal rating, DTR, and the demand response, D DSR. The first one exploits the flexibility from grid lines. And we will talk about that later. The second one exploits the flexibility from industrial loads. So we are talking about 
some, uh, uh, for example, some industrial, very big uh, industrial loads that can be programmable. It can be activated um, through the zonal EMS suggestions. Uh, next slide. Sorry. Okay. So since this uh, um, this algorithm is a forecast algorithm, it needs, of course, some forecast data. The first data are the nodal load forecasts, as you can see uh, on the left. These data are provided by uh, a software um, developed by RSC that's called Prevel. We will talk about that later. Indeed. Uh, of course, we need also the uh, generation forecast, both for uh, photovoltaic and wind, wind uh, generation, but also for thermal power plants. And these data are provided by standard Terna tools. When we have all these data, we can start the zonal EMS algorithm. So uh, it is made by four uh, modules. The first module is just check the imbalance. So we can say that it's just analyze if it's possible to reach the convergence for this uh, uh, calculation. The second module just check if there are congestions uh, with three hours higher time horizon. After that, um, DTR is used to manage these congestions in the module M3. And then the last model, the M4, just try to solve congestions using programmable loads. So thanks to the DSR provisions. All data, both input and output data, are, are showed in another uh, software that is the dashboard of the demo. The dashboard has been developed by engineering. Um, of course, it is written in the slide, I, I didn't say it, but the Zonal EMS has been developed by EBM, that it's another partner of the project. Now I will talk about the main results of this uh, uh, experimentation of the demo. Uh, we, um, we ran the Zonal EMS for several months. We uh, focused on the last uh, three months to uh, analyze the results. These results um, have, been have been analyzed through four KPIs. And we, we will uh, we'll show them now. The first KPI, K1, just analyze the reliability of the input data. So just we analyze if the input data are good enough to reach, um, to reach the convergence and to, re and to reach good quality results. Um, for example, as you can see here in this uh, graph on the left, uh, we, can, we can see for each week uh, of, many, of many times uh, input data were good enough. For example, on the week 38, the week 38, the 60% of instances um, had, we can say, uh, good input data for the zonal EMS. Um, when there are all these input data, we can analyze if the uh, zonal EMS reached the convergence. So just two out of 5.7 thousand instances uh, did not uh, correctly converge, did not correctly converge. So we can say that uh, the zonal EMS has got a very good convergence ability, of course. The last KPIs, uh, K3 and K4, just analyze the congestion detection ability, and we will uh, focus, we will focus uh, on them in this slide. In this slide, we just uh, uh, show uh, the accuracy, the precision, and the recall of the journal MS. We don't need to understand these formulas. We just can see this graph. And, um, and just take the main messages. Um, we can see that accuracy is very, very high. We can see on the other side that precision is discrete. 
it's more or less it's about as you can see in all the in all these weeks it's we can say about 0 0.4 0 0.6 sometimes it can reach also 0 0.8 but what does it mean first of all we we have got several lines different color colors of lines because uh, these performances were analyzed for different time horizons for the first the second the third quarter of hours uh, up to the uh, 12th quarter of hour. So accuracy is very high and precision is discrete. Accuracy gives information about how well the general MS is capable of detecting the real behavior of the grid. So uh, if, it's, um, if it's, it's capable of detecting when there, when there are real congestions and when there are no congestions. And it is, and it is very, very high. Um, but precision is discrete. What does it mean? It means that through negative, this number through negative t con n is very, very high. This means this means that uh, um, this happens because in the grid there are very, uh, very few congestions. This is a very important uh, fact to take into account. To take into account. Sorry. Um, in fact. Mm, we, we saw that during the experimentation, very few congestions happened in the grid. Because we have to take into account that the Ternal Central EMS is working too, meanwhile the Zonal EMS is working. So at the end, uh, very few congestions happened, so the Zonal EMS was capable of detecting um, all these true negative in the grid. Um, but sometimes um, it detects a lot of congestions, so FP is very high. This is the reason why the precision is discrete. So it means that the general MS detects a lot of fast congestions. This happens for the same reason as before. Uh, the general MS detects congestions, forecast congestions, but meanwhile the Terna EMS uh, will will solve them. The recall, its main, uh, its the most important uh, parameter, is the ability to detect real congestions. It's just the ratio between the um, forecast and correct congestions, true congestions, and the total number of congestions that happened. So it is more or less 0 0.5. It means that one out of two real congestions were correctly forecast by the general EMS. That it's quite good. Uh, some conclusions, to be short, um, the general EMS uh, converged a lot, so its convergence ability is very, very high. Um, but sometimes it detects a lot of false congestions, as we said, but it is due to the fact that the uh, Terna EMS is solving them. Um, at the end, possible improvements, of course, of the general MS for the future. Um, we can, of course, forecast the um, the grid asset. Our, our hypothesis was that the um, grid asset was uh, uh, fixed, but of course, during three hours uh, time horizon, it can change. And, it, and uh, we saw that it changed. So we can forecast the grid, as, the grid uh, asset, so we can introduce an admittance matrix forecast. Or uh, uh, another possible improvement can be to, to uh, formulate an AC optimal power flow instead of a DC optimal power flow. It means to have a more complex algorithm, but it will be uh, more accurate. And of course, to improve the results of the, the performances of the general MS, we can also improve input data quality. Um, the next speaker will be Dario Ronzio that uh, it works for RSC and uh, uh, he developed the Prevel, the nodal load forecast algorithm. Thank you. Um, okay, I uh, try to 
show my screen. Okay. Is it okay? Can you see me? Yes, yeah. Presentation mode. Oh yeah, yes. So just a moment. Because here, okay. Uh, good afternoon. So, uh, is it possible to uh, can you um, see the screen now? Yes, in a yes. correct uh, manner. Uh, yes, now it uh, works well. Chat is a video. A video uh, was uh, activated. Okay. Okay, I'm Darionzo from uh, RSC, as uh, Giuseppe said. And my, I, I have to, my talk is about the um, development and uh, implementation of a forecast algorithm and their performance. Uh, as, uh, oh, oh, just because I have some problem here. With, uh, uh, okay. Uh, the zona energy management system, as gravity before, uh, requires a representation of a state of a grid a few hours ahead. This means that uh, I have to produce the uh, for about uh, 800 of, uh, nodes of the transmission line um, the forecast of a load with a uh, time horizon of three hours and a time step of uh, 15 minutes. The aim and the, uh, the hope is of this activity uh, was that uh, the forecast uh, was better than uh, the persistence uh, and this is not assured uh, in any case. Uh, and the second point is also is necessary to, is important uh, also uh, to identify which categories of loads were really difficult to predict. Um, we have to face the, with some challenges. First of all, uh, the grid status uh, or the state of the grid has a very high dynamic. Um, this means that uh, almost every 15 minutes uh, there are changes uh, in the grid topology. Uh, so in correspondence of the same node uh, where I have to produce the forecast, uh, um, sometimes the number of loads change in time. And this is a problem when we have to produce the training set. Uh, the other important uh, aspect is that uh, what is what we have to predict. Uh, we have not to predict load or generation separately, but uh, we have to predict the net load uh, called also um, exchange. That is the difference between load and generation. But this is, uh, this creates a problem because uh, the features of a net load depends uh, on those of a distributed generation of the photovoltaic essentially, and uh, depends uh, also on the feature of a load. And uh, another problem is that we have uh, both domestic loads and uh, industrial loads. Uh, so this net load is uh, uh, a very complex quantity. Uh, furthermore, there is also another problem uh, due to uh, the fact that the integration area is not a closed uh, system and we need boundaries at the integration domain. Uh, so there are some um, boundary lines and uh, these boundary lines were managed as if they were conventional loads. Uh, very briefly, uh, our strong assumption, initial assumption, was that the loads were, were uh, weather dependent. And this is a very strong assumption because uh, uh, we have also um, industrial loads. Industrial loads are not. Uh, essentially uh, weather dependent. Uh, so in any case, uh, we use uh, as a predictor for uh, our forecasting systems, um, some weather um, variables, uh, weather variables that, uh, oh, sorry, some variables uh, um, provided by some uh, numerical models uh, is not important here, the acronyms, uh, the matter is that uh, 
uh, we use uh, two different uh, two different uh, regional models, uh, RAMS and WRF, uh, and these uh, regional models uh, with a um, spatial resolution of four kilometers uh, and temporal resolution of 15 minutes uh, in the output uh, were driven by two uh, global models, uh, one from the USA and uh, another one is the European uh, models. Um, with these variables, uh, besides uh, uh, the lead time of the forecast and uh, uh, the calendar days, um, we produced two uh, different kind of, uh, um, of forecast. One is named a short term forecast for two days ahead, and a, another uh, very short term forecast um, developed. Um, essentially, this uh, very short term is uh, applied every 15 minutes, uh, every uh, during uh, all the day. Um, another thing, uh, it's true that the demo area is only this uh, small part in red, uh, but uh, we have to produce the forecast for the also for the extended area. So uh, our product, our forecast, uh, uh, are performed for about. Uh, Mm, 1,000 uh, configuration of loads or 800 uh, subnets, uh, grid points, um, distributed in a half a part of the uh, Italian territory. Mm, so our prediction consists of uh, two stages, as I said, a short term, short term uh, forecast was performed using a machine learning algorithm, random forest, with a training period of two of six months. And this uh, short term was continuously updated and adjusted using a very short term. Um, they essentially, um, the predictors of the short, the very short term uh, were the, uh, the, short, uh, the short term above, uh, also some other temperature, air temperature and global radiation and uh, the freshest uh, measurements of loads. Uh, the idea is that the forecasting scheme must be able to identify the features of both generation and demand. And uh, this is uh, uh, in charge of the uh, short term. The very short term uh, is an adjustment of that uh, forecast. Uh, this is uh, an example of a very easy uh, case. Uh, in black is uh, measurements, blue is uh, the uh, short term. The short term um, obtains a good results in this case uh, with a mean average error uh, that is uh, described by this formulation is only an average error between the absolute difference between the uh, prediction and the measurements, uh, but is uh, divided by the mean of the overall mean uh, measurements in the period considered. And we consider the four months of data from uh, August to November uh, 2021. When we applied the very short term, obtain the red uh, line with, uh, in this case, a, a better uh, results the mean absolute error passed from 4% uh, in uh, with a short term to a 2.8% with the short term with respect uh, uh, of a number of greater than 7% if we consider we have we were consider uh, the persistence the persistence is the uh, is presented here uh, with a dot green lines uh, but this is uh, this was a very simple case. Um, this is a, a more usual case. In this case, the uh, short term uh, is uh, in difficult because uh, it, it is possible to describe the bet, uh, very well uh, some days, but there is a large error in other days. And this due is due to the different behavior of the measurements during the training set, essentially. Um, there is a, a change in the baseline uh, during the time, but uh, when we consider uh, the uh, very short term, the adjustment in real time, in, also in this case, there is uh, an improvement. 
uh, if you consider if you consider uh, the overall errors in this case uh, uh, we have the uh, behavior of a mean absolute error with respect to the uh, forecast horizon and the dot line the straight line dotted uh, is the uh, persistence and this line the curve line is uh, uh, the very short term one also uh, this is for a demo area or the, uh, for external area in any case uh, the prediction uh, obtain better results after uh, uh, 30 minutes essentially in during the first 30 minutes uh, persistence is a very well very good uh, uh, forecasting system in this case uh, there is a uh, we have used a different uh, um, kind of uh, errors uh, to uh, check the uh, performance of the system of a forecasting system and in this case uh, we have a daily variability of the absolute uh, uh, net load error for the typical day so uh, if you fixed uh, the time uh, uh, for example at the midday i'm here and uh, at midday uh, i consider all loads belonging to the demo area uh, for the four months uh, of a uh, period uh, analyzed in this uh, uh, in this in this analysis um, in this case uh, the gray the light gray bands uh, here uh, shows the uh, fifth to 95th uh, percentiles this means that uh, uh, errors larger than 10 megawatt uh, are present but in the tails. We, so uh, they are numerically um, less important, uh, even if they are uh, in size uh, quite uh, important. Um, usually, when you speak about um, load, you say used another um, error. Uh, this is MAP. MAP is a mean average percentage error. And this percentage is a instantaneous percentage. Uh, so that uh, every 15 minutes uh, you consider the difference between uh, forecast and uh, measurements divided by the uh, instantaneous measurements in that uh, instant. Um, problem is that uh, when the measurements is very low, this percentage is very high. So there are uh, quite easily divergences. Uh, thinking you have to take into account that uh, uh, when we have a uh, generation, uh, the load changes from, pass from positive values to negative values. And so during the day, we have also moments during uh, which uh, we have uh, um, very low values of this load net. Um, the takeaway messages from travel. Uh, the first is that uh, the exchange is not uh, pre always predictable, really. Uh, our strong assumption was that uh, there is uh, a correlation between, uh, between this uh, uh, variable and the weather, uh, weather variables, but uh, this is not uh, the case of industrial uh, loads, essentially. So uh, it should be necessary to classify, first of all, the various types of loads and uh, use different uh, forecasting system, not only uh, regarding the um, forecasting horizons, but also for different typologies of loads. So if you consider only domestic generation, okay, and domestic uh, loads, uh, what we have done, what we have implemented uh, is right. But when we have to consider also uh, industrial loads, uh, the excursion and uh, the fluctuations and the trends of this kind of loads uh, are not correlated with weather. And so um, introducing and using as, a pre as a, uh, predictors uh, weather variables is sometimes misleading. Um, we have found that 80% uh, of the nodes uh, were predictable in this sense, uh, and uh, only the 20% of nodes uh, were not. Uh, 
bearish short term uh, is uh, obtains uh, always a better persistence, better results than persistence uh, if uh, forecast horizons uh, are longer than 30 minutes. Uh, and some work has to be uh, also done because uh, we have some difficulties and some problems. And, and uh, again, yet um, because uh, essentially due to the trend, the construction of a training data sets. Uh, and this is uh, for the high, highly dynamic of, uh, of the loads. Um, this configuration, during the time, there were new loads and the new loads um, haven't uh, uh, in training data set enough long to be uh, predictable. Uh, I think that uh, this is uh, um, all for this part. Uh, and if you have any question, I will be pleased to answer them. I can pass the condivision to David. Thank you, Dario. And good morning, everybody. I'm David Poli from the University of Pisa. And uh, let's now speak about uh, um, transmission capacities. So everybody knows that the maximum current that can be that can flow on an overhead power line is limited by the performance of the material and by the phase to ground clearance that is available span by span. So this means that the rating of the line is strictly related to the temperature of the conductors in the different operating conditions of the line. So traditionally, the TSOs have used static thermal rating procedures to assess this capacity, which means assuming the worst better condi weather condition that can stress the temperature of the conductor. But this assumption is very conservative. And in many hours, the power line turns out to be uh, um, underexploited. So uh, dynamic thermal rating conversely uses sensors or weather forecasting to, make into, to take into account the real operating conditions of the line and uh, captures the fact that the weather conditions are not constant and that when we apply um, a, to the power line, a sudden step of current, we don't obtain a sudden step in the conductor temperature, rather quite a slow first order response like this, like this, with the time constants of several minutes. And this provides TSOs with an important form of flexibility and helping their decisions and the decision making especially in case of transient grid congestions. So in the weather-based procedure we, de we developed in Osmose here at the University of Pisa, the, the, the local weather expected for the following three hours is forecasted by RSE, thus providing span by span and with steps of 15 minutes, the expected weather quantities that feed the thermal model of the line. So in the so-called free evolution mode, the power flow is also forecasted and the tool calculates at each time step and span by span, all the thermal and mechanical quantities of the line that are expected on the line for the next hour. So we are able to check all mechanical and thermal constraints at each span of the line. Conversely, when we search this, the so-called opacity of the line, we impose the thermal and mechanical limits. And with a dichotomic approach applied to our models, we calculate the maximum current that can be sustained for a given time horizon while respecting all these limits, starting from the present conditions of the conductor. And by varying this horizon, we obtain the so-called loadability curve of the line. For example, 1,000 amperes can be sustained for 15 minutes or 800 amperes can be sustained for 30 minutes and so on. And all this procedure in Osmose was online and fully automatic 
thanks to our partners engineering under the supervision of course of Terna. This is very important to underline, to understand that the, to perform this calculation, we don't need only good weather forecasting for the next hours, but also the historical, or at least the estimated evolution of weather and power flow in the last, let's say two hours. This is important to estimate the initial temperature of our conductor. And this is the crucial weakness of the weather-based procedures with respect to the more complex but also more expensive sensor-based algorithms that conversely measure directly on the conductor this initial uh, temperature. In uh, Osmose, all this approach was applied to two sub-transmission uh, sub power lines with different number of spans, 20 and 30, and different conductor, conductor sections. And uh, with the result that the, the, uh, the calculation times were always lower than 10 seconds to calculate the loadability curve for 12 time horizons between 15 minutes to three hours. This is just to tell you that we adopted the DC gray thermal model of power lines also to high temperature, low salt conductors. And uh, to give you an idea of the new mechanical model we developed to consider also the mechanical interaction between uh, the different spans of the line, which means the impact of the possible rotation of the insulator strings on forces and salts. And this allows to uh, checking the maximum temperature and the maximum salt at each single span of the line. Of course, now I will spare you all the equations of the two of the two models, but we have published several papers with all the mathematical details about this approach. So when we compare, like here on the left, the constant static thermal rating with the maximum current that can be sustained, let's say for uh, 118 minutes, so three hours, obtained with the dynamic thermal rating, we obtain a quantitative measure of the fact that the STR assumes uh, extreme and very conservative constant weather conditions that stress the temperature of the conductors. On the contrary, the DTR uses forecasted realistic conditions that usually are not so extreme, and especially in winter correspond to a higher conductor cooling than, the, than is supposed by the uh, static thermal rating. And this is why typically the dynamic thermal rating also on this time horizon, this long-term time horizon is higher than the static thermal rating. This is in fact the winter duration curve we obtained for the KPI that expresses the how much the DTR is higher in percent with respect to the uh, STR, so to the static rating. We can see that in winter, this KPI is always positive. So DTR is always higher than us, STR. And that in extreme um, a cold night conditions, we can have a DTR can be up to four times plus 300% with respect to STR. And that in the 30% of winter hours, the, the DTR is um, twice the STR. Uh, while in summer, here on the, on the right, um, the DTR reaches plus 120% with respect to STR. It doubles the STR in around 2% of hours, and in average, it, it is the STR plus, let's say, 50%. And in 1% here on the right, on, on the right, the, of, the, um, of the hours in summer, the, the DTR captures correctly that the, uh, dynamic, the real dynamic thermal rating with the real weather is lower than the STR, but only in 1% of summer hours. Conversely, when we compare, like here on the, on the left, the STR with respect to the maximum current that can be sustained for 15 minutes, not three hours, uh, we measure the fact that the, the DTR considered the thermal inertia of the conductor 
and its first order dynamic model with a time constant of around, let's say, eight or 10 minutes, like I, I said before. So uh, if the DTR at three hours, the previous slide, benefits from realistic weather conditions, here the DTR at 15 minutes captures, in addition, the dynamic aspects of the conductor heating. And this is why the current that can be sustained for 15 minutes is always higher than the current that can be sustained for three hours. This behavior is clear in winter here. So the DTR in, uh, we in, um, for three hours is in blue and for 15 minutes is in orange. So with an average additional gain of around 30%, with respect to the previous slide, and also in summer here on the right, with an additional 25% uh, on average of capacity. And uh, while the current that can be sustained uh, for 15 minutes is lower than the STR only in 0.3% of the, of the hour we analyzed. Uh, this was about one of the two sub-transmission lines, but the very similar results we have obtained with the other transmission line, the one with the smaller conductor. And now I leave the floor to my colleague, Professor Baccaro, for a focus on the sensor-based dynamic thermal rating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Davide. And uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, I hope that you can see my screen now. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, in uh, in this new in this second approach, we try to solve the same problem with a different uh, uh, with a different uh, technology. Our idea is to uh, acquire a set of easily observed variables measured at uh, ground level and in particular the wind speed, wind direction, environmental temperature. And thanks to mathematical model, we generate a virtual measurement of the conductor temperature by considering all the uncertainty affecting the um, modeling process. This kind of approach allowed to avoid the need for measuring the conductor temperature. Then, in order to improve the uh, per perversion of, these, uh, of the measurement, we propose the employment of very um, uh, easy sensors built by a sensor networks. Uh, the sensor networks allow to increase the number of sensors distributed along the line route, because this sensor, as we will see later, are equipped by a, co a cooperative communication uh, system, which allow them to exchange local information, to compute several complex features, for example, to synchronize the measurements, to detect voltage errors, to detect data anomaly, and to propagate this information uh, along the line route until the uh, end of the line when there is a so-called master node which collect the computation and send these computations to uh, the control center. The mathematics which is integrated, the, the, the modeling which is integrated in these sensor networks are based on advanced thermal modeling equipped uh, with uh, interval uh, arithmetic based computing uh, Self-organizing sensor networks, which are um, in order to propagate the information along the, uh, along the sensor networks without the need for a wide area networks. It's, everything is based on a very easy radio modem. And the capability of the sensor network to detect uh, data errors and measurement errors and sensor errors. So the idea is to, uh, to develop, we prototype this system, which is built on a microprocessor and a set of um, very easy uh, sensors, which are a ultrasonic wind sensors, which allows to measure, to acquire the wind spin and direction at the, let's say three meters 
above the ground, grounds, environmental temperature. And thanks to this data, a mathematical model allows to compute the conductor temperature. This conductor temperature is equipped by, in order to simulate a virtual dynamical system, which state depends by the state of all the sensors in the networks. The sensors exchange this data by a short radio communication interface. The mathematic, mathematical backbone, backbone supporting this method is described in several papers, which um, in details express what are the models, what are the communication protocols, and so on. Once you have a thermal models which allow you to estimate the conductor temperature, it is possible to compute the load capability curve. Uh, this is uh, developed by each uh, sensor by solving a, um, a, a, an iterative pro uh, procedure, by implementing an iterative procedures, uh, which allow to solve starting from the real conditions, starting from the real conductor temperature, which is the initial condition in, the, in this computing process, starting from the forecasting environmental temperature, which has been computed, which have been computed in uh, uh, remotely. Um, this process allows to compute the load capability curve, namely to assess for each hypothetical load, which is the maximum time that the load can be uh, supported by the line without overcoming a fixed temperature. A very interesting feature of this approach is that the sensor networks is resilient also in the presence of communication faults. In particular, if there are some kind of faults or anomaly in the communication, the nodes, which is uh, uh, not properly working, it will be uh, eliminated from the sensor networks. And this information, this alarm, is generated in order to um, inform the grid operator about the sensor faults. Uh, this uh, method has been uh, prototyped. We prototyped uh, say, uh, uh, nine sensors uh, um, split in two sensor networks. So we developed two sensor networks, each one composed by four nodes, which have been deployed along two um, uh, two transmission lines. And by comparing again the thermal rating computed by this approach, which allow you to estimate the real capability cure or with a good degree of accuracy, it is possible to confirm the conclusion uh, outlined by Professor Poli. There is a, 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 is available a large quantity of capacity which could be reliable exploited and could improve sensible uh, flexibility. So we, um, we, there are uh, several other results, but uh, um, in order for a short time, I, I prefer to give you just a picture about the possibility of applying this method in the task of reliably improving the grid uh, flexibility. And I'd like to highlight the need, uh, the only need, the only requirement of this method is to uh, have a good connectivity, radio connectivity between the nodes. Uh, in particular, each node should be uh, the distance, the maximum distance between each nodes, each measurement node is network is about five kilometers, from five to 10 kilometers in order to have a redundancy in the communication. So for example, you can easily distribute these nodes every five kilometers, 10 kilometers in order to have a reliable estimation of the critical spam, of the critical location of the hotspot temperature. Now I leave the floor again to Terna. Thank you, Professor. I will take the screen once again. Okay. So uh, I think it was very interesting technical discussion so far. As you can see, this was just a part of the demo Italian demonstrator, uh, but we have seen so many interesting uh, topics. 
and uh, uh, I think, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, explaining in such detail uh, what we have done. And uh, I guess it's uh, up to me to just draw the conclusion for this part of the demonstrator and explain the key takeaways uh, to conclude the presentation, then leave the room for uh, questions. So uh, these first slides I want to, so we, we talk about uh, DTR and uh, by no means this wants to be um, uh, a comparison to understand which is the best. The two approach uh, Professor Poli and Professor Varcaro presented are uh, very innovative and complementary, I must say, uh, because we have seen that uh, one of the main um, uh, interesting aspects for a TSO is that uh, they can perform well even in areas where there is uh, uh, low range for telecommunications. And um, in the case of uh, the sensor base, the another advantage is that the sensor are not installed on the line, on the power lines, but on, on the pylons, which is very helpful for, uh, for us for the maintenance and for the installation. But also we must take into account that the weather base uh, requires no sensor on the field. So in uh, in an environment with a very harsh condition, they, they can be exploited even uh, better. So as we can see, there are many uh, advantages for uh, every method. And here you just see an example of a comparison of the loadability curves for uh, just uh, less than, it's about a week of, uh, of uh, data uh, for the loadability curve at uh, three hours ahead. And as you can see there, the red curve is the, the reference curve from the, the Mika solution. And you can see that the, the sensor base is, uh, which is the green one, uh, is always below the, the the reference, and the uh, the average error is is quite it's quite good. Uh, you can see the 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 mean standard deviation for the error in the temperature and the uh, the the error of the opacity, uh, which is always likely underestimated, which is a conservative. For the weather base, you can see sometimes that uh, it is above. And um, uh, these slides help us to understand not only the, the, the strong point, but also the, the, the attention we must focus on when, when using these models. So uh, also the weather base, as the Professor Paul explained, uh, showed up very interesting results. Uh, but it, as he said, this is uh, more prone to sensitivity to wind speed uh, and di wind direction errors. We, we perform some uh, sensitivity analysis and even one meter per second uh, of error on the weather forecast can be can be crucial and uh, but also we found uh, more uh, um, uh, improvement uh, room for recalibration of the model parameters for the thermomechanical uh, parameter of the lines starting from the Seagram model so again uh, both uh, performed very well and showed up to an additional 300% of nominal line opacity for some hours of the winter. And on an average, we've seen for many, many hours of the year uh, to even exploit the double of the flexibility of the line. So really interesting results for, the, for a TSO. And uh, finally, this is just, uh, so this was a, a more technical takeaway. Uh, this is uh, the takeaway we presented to the final conference we held in Paris when the project was declared. Uh, finish. And uh, as you can see, the blue part is the, the key message we wanted to, to present to the um, European Commission about what we discussed today. And the gray area is about what I discussed at the start. So we also tested flexibility from wind power plants in industrial demand side response. Today, I don't have the time to, to read this, but I will leave the presentation. And so if you are interested in this, you can reach to us to, to understand also the other result. But for what matters, the the application of advanced dispatching uh, techniques so uh, to deploy a smart management system uh, which is coupled with uh, uh, such relevant information from uh, load forecasts at the nodal level and um, uh, DTR uh, information which are capital light so they, they cost of course less than uh, making new lines. This is um, a strategy which is complementary to the development of the grid, which it will always be needed for reinforcing critical uh, spots of the grid. But uh, for the better exploitation of what we already have, this is something TSO should uh, really consider. 
So uh, I conclude now, this is uh, just a few slides. One is about some uh, readings you may find interesting and that uh, involve what we discussed today. And uh, before closing, I want to remind everyone that this is not the last webinar for, uh, for Osmos in ISGAN. There will be several others, and the next one is going to be on uh, the demonstration close to real-time cross-border flexibility market from, uh, from Elesh, so from the work package for, from Slovenia. And I recommend you to register to them as well.